So I'm just going to give a few updates from the um, Auburn Plant Diagnostic Lab. The first thing that we saw this year was a lot of coal damage, uh, as you can expect from the deep freeze that we had around Christmas time, and then the two freezes um, later in the spring. Uh, and coal damage can look different on different species. It can range from complete death of the plant to bleaching of the foliage, um, to just discoloration of the plant and dieback. Uh, but one of the telltale signs of coal damage, um, you can see here at the base of the plants is the bark cracking. So this happens because the moisture, the water inside the plant freezes and it expands and it has nowhere to go. So it just busts right through the bark. Um, so a lot of the times that can lead to dieback. That also opens up a big wound in the plant that other pathogens can get in and start causing disease. So we saw a lot of dieback on a lot of different species. And then our strawberry woes continued into the spring. We saw a lot of black root rot, and this just creates these small um, unthrifty looking plants look like they're not growing. And this is because we had a cold and wet spring um, during the beginning of the strawberry season this year. And that's not really conducive for plant growth, but it is conducive for fungi to grow. And so when growers see these plants not growing, they start putting out more fertilizer and it causes even more problems. With black root rot, um, if you cut the crowns open, the crown looks completely healthy, but the roots are black. Um, and the, this is actually a complex of fungi. And the main one that we saw this year was rhizoctonia. And then we started seeing um, plants collapsing, and this is when anthracnose and phytophthora started causing problems. Um, so whenever we see plants collapsing, we always cut the crowns open and examine the crowns. So these top three pictures here, these are anthracnose crown rot, and you can tell anthracnose crown rot because you get this marbling of browns and reds and normal plant tissue. And then this is Phytophthora crown rot. You can tell that because you see this dark brown discoloration. It's very discreet. Um, and then we even saw some cold damage in strawberries this year, especially from growers that didn't cover their plants during the deep freeze that we had around Christmas. And you can tell that because you get this water soaking in the crowns of the plants. And, um, Edgar and Ed Zakora and myself have been looking out for the Neopestilatiopsis leaf spot and fruit rot. Uh, we have found it in seven counties so far this year um, in Baldwin, Escambia, Chilton, Houston, Geneva, Coleman, and Tuscaloosa. But the good thing is that we have only seen it coming in and being a problem late in the season. So it starts out as these leaf spots on the leaves. And they look like every other leaf spot out there. But then it starts moving down into the petioles. When you get the spots on the petioles, it will girdle it. And then that, that um, leaf will collapse. Um, and then from there, it moves down into the crown. And that's when you start having a lot of problems like they've had in Florida. It's when you get um, crown rot and collapse of the whole plants. So we haven't seen it move down into the crown yet. We've only seen it causing leaf spots. And in one case, we saw it causing uh, lesions on the petioles, causing the leaves to die. Uh, we've also seen it causing fruit rot. Um, the way you tell this disease, if you look at it with a hand lens, you can see these um, black spore tendrils that come up. Um, it looks like little dots of pepper on the leaf spot. Um, and then these spore tendrils are just filled with millions and millions of spores. Uh, we did have two locations this year where we found it at the same location two years in a row. So that's kind of concerning. Um, it could be establishing there. And remember, this is a disease that is really hard to control. Um, they're the University of Florida did a fungicide trial and they found that switch and theorem were the best fungicides to control it, but even they only provided about 50% control compared to the, um, the actual controls in the test. 
And SWITCH did not previously have a label for controlling this particular pathogen, although it was able to be used on strawberries. So um, Edsecora got us a um, label 2EE for SWITCH so that we can actually recommend for growers to use this product to control this pathogen. Another disease that I wanted to talk about that's um, being surveyed for right now is vascular street dieback. Um, so this has popped up in several places across the Southeast. Um, most of them have been traced back to Tennessee. And so in certain species, they're seeing a dieback in um, multiple plant species, uh, only in nursery production settings. We haven't really found it in the landscape yet. So since Tennessee um, seemed to have kind of spread this around a little bit, they took an initiative um, to get a grant to do a survey across the Southeast. And our Department of Agriculture has uh, teamed up with them. So they are actively surveying for this in the nurseries in Alabama now. So it's caused by Cerrado basidium, which is in the Rhizoctonia species complex. And one thing that I say about Rhizoctonia is that it never hides itself. And I'll explain more about that in just a minute. But there is a similar disease to this one also caused by Cerrado basidium in cocoa in Southeastern Asia. It causes a lot of problems there. So these are the hosts of vas vascular streak. Um, all of these have been shown to be hosts, but the top five are the main ones. It's the Eastern Redbud, Flowering Dogwood, Coosa Dogwood, Red Maple, and Freeman's Maple. And so this is what it looks like in red bud. You start getting um, yellow foliage and then it'll turn necrotic and then you'll start getting dieback of the branches. And then you get these little bitty leaves that stay yellow that they call mouse ear leaves. Um, and then especially in red bud, you get this uh, very prominent streaking in the vascular system. And what's happening is the fungus is clogging up the vascular system um, blocking transport of water throughout the plant, causing all this dieback. This is what it looks like in maple. You just get a um, non-discrete dieback. And in dogwood, you get dieback and you can get um, some foliar scorching and then the leaves fall off. So I said that rhizoctonia doesn't like to hide. Um, so what happens with this pathogen is when you're under, or when it's under um, the right conditions, which are abundant moisture, uh, the fungus will start growing out of wounds in the plant tissue. And it can be very thick and yellow at times. Um, it can also come off of leaf scars, cut ends, pruning ends, anything like that. So like I said, we haven't found this in Alabama yet. Um, I expect that if they do find it in Alabama, it's probably gonna be in North Alabama um, because they get a lot of their material out of Tennessee there. The last thing I wanna show here, because Meredith and I looked at um, an ivy sample of this recently, is broad mites. So broad mites are very tiny mites um, and their saliva is toxic to plant tissue. So you end up getting these um, leaves that won't expand and they get distorted and everything. A lot of the times this gets written off as herbicide damage. So I just wanted to show this and point it out. You can get um, strappy looking leaves. Uh, you can get distorted leaves. Um, it all to me looks like herbicide damage until you look at it closer and you find the mites. Uh, these are, like I said, tiny mites. Um, they're smaller than spider mites, so you're never going to see them with the naked eye. Um, and they can get, their population can expand very rapidly. So um, miticides are needed once you find them. And, um, but not all miticides will control them. And you do have to do um, rotations because they can build up resistance to miticides very easily. And that was all I had for today.